I think the good thing with all this, especially like with this field that we're in at this time, is there's just so much work and potential and opportunity of stuff that didn't exist, you know, a couple of years ago. And right. it's changing by the day. Welcome back, everyone, to Press Record with Kellen Rack. Today, we have a very, very special guest. This is Pat Henderson of Path 8 Productions. He is uh, absolutely one of the biggest of big time production guys in Boston, Mass. And he's also a good friend of mine. I would even consider him a mentor. So welcome to the show, Pat. How's it going? Good. I think you overhyped me a bit on that um, intro, but I'll take it. Great, no, great we, to be we, on and thanks for having me. There's absolutely no overhyping when it comes to Pat Anderson, but let me let me just tell a brief little bit about your company. So Path 8 Productions is a Boston-based video production company. Path 8 focuses on telling your company or organization's story through the power of video. They specialize in healthcare, public health agencies, and education sectors, but the list goes on and on and so much beyond that. So Pat, tell us a little bit about yourself. I want to hear kind of the gist of the career story, where you began and how you got to where you are now. Yeah, for sure. So um, it all began back in high school. I was really into video production. I loved it. Um, I had, you know, the video production class, um, took as many of them as I could. And my favorite moment of high school and one of my favorite moments ever, we me and four of my friends who were big in, in the class did a music video to Elton John and Kiki D's Don't Go Breaking My Heart. And I I played Elton John and my friend who was the center or one of the linemen on the football team, offense and defense, was Kiki D in a dress and a wig. And we played that. They, we had morning announcements that were video and we played that on the morning announcements. And when we walked in the hallways after that, like that morning coming out of class and walking in and just everyone's reaction and seeing that it was an unbeatable moment and just like really got me super into video even more so than I was before. So really kind of fell in love with it. How but, could you decide at that point between going into video or going into uh, a music career? I mean, that's just <laughs> my, my voice decided that for me. I'm like you. I'm not a man of many <laughs> talents, just like one. OK, talent. So, um, yeah, after that, though, this was 2004. I graduated from high school and um, the, the avenues in video weren't what they are now, where essentially I figured I could you know, try to go into the, the movie realm of things or news, local TV type stuff. And I wasn't super interested in either of those kind of careers. So um, I went into college, did marketing, um, you know, enjoyed that, got out of college, got a marketing job for a medical device company. It was more of a administrative type marketing job. Um, eventually got them to let me do some creative type marketing, um, got my hands into some video work, very like, you know, lower level video work that I got to do there. And it was great and I loved it, but it was never going to be a full time job there. So started freelancing on the side. Um, I had one corporate client and started a wedding business. Um, it's the easiest to get into and I enjoyed I enjoyed doing it. So kind of built that up over time, got a job working for the health Boston Public Health Commission as their multimedia producer doing graphic design and video work. And that's kind of where I, my first actual job where I was in this industry, um, aside from my freelance. While there, I kept progressing my freelance work, um, gaining more clients, getting more projects, um, you know, just really getting a lot of experience with it there. Um, and was that mainly wedding work at this point or were you doing commercial work? Was there any social media video going on at this point or was it sort of all pre that era? Yeah, this is like 2012 to 2016. I was at the commission. So social media stuff was picking up. People needed videos for their websites and that sort of thing. Um, so I was doing more corporate at that time, still had the weddings going, um, and 2016, I got a job with the Red Sox, um, a production assistant job there, um, part time. And that was kind of the opportunity where I was like, OK, I have this solid full time job that's like very comfortable and I'm still able to do freelance. 
um, and I have this part-time opportunity kind of doing something super fun, working for the Red Sox, which is like a complete dream job. Mm -hmm. Um, now's probably my chance to kind of go for it. I was, you know, late twenties probably. And, um, yeah, just about to turn 30, just about to get married, all that type of stuff or just got married. And so I was like, now's the time to go for it. Luckily my wife was really supportive and, um, yeah, went for it, went to do with the Red Sox part time and then build out freelance more. And from there, um, I want to I want to pause on yeah. this moment real quick, because this is such a pivotal moment before we get into path eight as it is today. So, first of all, let's let's just discuss quickly that when you worked at the Red Sox is where you and I met this. That's why it's this is the pivotal moment. This, this is, is well, where that's Helen Rett came <laughs> yeah, into you my know life. What? This is this is the pivotal moment. Um, no, no. The pivotal moment is you making the jump from full time work to doing your own thing. But I just have a couple funny Pat Henderson stories <laughs> from our time at the Red Sox. So I'd already been there a couple of years. Pat came in as a kind of a star production assistant doing fantastic work for us. And every day, every game day at the Boston Red Sox, the staff got to go to the, the media dining hall where you would have a meal, nothing glamorous, but it gave you some food before the game, something to eat. There was an ice cream machine. There were you know various things, a salad bar. And everybody kind of moaned and groaned about the food not being incredible. But Pat, he became the king of the dining hall because he decided he was going to just make these incredible creations. Pat was scooping peanut butter into a cup and then filling it with ice cream and topping it with some incredible toppings that nobody even realized you could you could mix in the dining hall. He was making these crazy grilled cheeses. He was just doing the coolest things, and it changed the game for everyone. So Pat Henderson, the king of Boston Red Sox media dining. That is a legend right there. So just one of your one of your many talents. I love eating. And uh, any opportunity <laughs> I get to do that for free, especially, you got to take advantage. I was, at the end of every meal, Kellen would be like, you, you screaming tonight? You screaming? I, I would never turn down ice cream. So I well, had every single night. You can't. Yeah. And there were there were all these toppings. And really, nobody was doing the peanut butter thing before Pat. So that was a game changing moment. I went over they, that peanut butter and jelly bar and just really <laughs> introduced it to the ice cream bar. <laughs> they should put your name under it. It's not just peanut butter. It's Pat Henderson. <laughs> but anyways, anyways, the real reason this was a pivotal moment is because and I was going to ask you about this anyway. This is the moment. This is the time, the chunk of time in your life where you decided to make that jump from the corporate world, from the full-time world, and jump into doing it yourself and starting your own business. Do you remember, was that like a specific couple days or was it kind of gradual while you were working at the Red Sox, building out your freelance that you thought, hey, maybe I could actually make this happen? Do you remember those thoughts going through your head at that time? Yeah, so it was a tricky time because the Red Sox job, while really exciting and awesome, um, you've worked in sports and for anybody who's worked in sports, everyone wants to work in sports. So not the highest paying jobs or much to sustain a lifestyle off of, mm -hmm. especially if you're, you know, approaching 30, um, and married and have a mortgage and all that stuff. So, um, kind of, I took a look at it and said, all right, I made X amount of freelance last year. If I'm able to free up more of my time, I'm sure I can make more in freelance. And then that will kind of balance out the Red Sox, that'll be an awesome opportunity for, you know, meeting people, my portfolio and just selfishly um, a ton of fun, like getting to work for the team that I was obsessed with my whole life. So um, kind of, you know, if that opportunity came around four years later, it wouldn't have been doable. And if it came uh, four years earlier, I wouldn't have had enough freelance to kind of offset it. So it really came along at a perfect time. And through that job, definitely um, it made a huge impact um, as far as being able to grow out um, path eight as I got that moving more, which we can get into. Yeah. And and well, yeah, let's talk a little bit about path eight. So, you know, you you're working part time at the Red Sox. You're doing all this freelance work. What makes you say I can build an LLC here, I can incorporate, I can start hiring employees, you know, because because at first I'm assuming you were doing this mainly solo, just kind of taking on projects on the side by yourself. At what point do you say, let's make this kind of an enterprise or the beginnings of something bigger than just me? Yeah, so that was a real gra gradual process and not something that was kind of like 
looked at and planned out like, okay, in a year I'm going to have an employee in two years, I'm going to have two employees, whatever it may be. It was just kind of assessing where I'm at and then reacting to that, having a little bit of foresight in it. But essentially, um, every, I was at the Red Sox for four years, every year I did less Red Sox work, more freelance work to the point where the final season I would come in and do some games. And then that was basically it. One of the great thing two I think the probably, you know, aside from how great that job was and, and all the perks that go with it, um, having that to to introduce yourself to clients and be like, oh, yeah, I would work for the Red Sox. It's instant credibility and also just like something that people love to talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you're talking with somebody who has spends all their time in the healthcare marketing world and then they get to chat about the Red Sox for a bit like that's fun and also if you work for the Red Sox they see your work it it's instant credibility and the other thing is all the awesome people who also worked at the Red Sox yourself included um, it gave me a lot of people that I could rely on as really talented freelance people where as I was growing and it was the point where you know and initially I would produce shoot edit everything there was for the project solo, you know, and over time you build in, have somebody come with you on shoots and then hand off some editing to somebody and then kind of trust other people to go do shoots and then trust other people to edit and kind of build things from there. Having that really good base of like vetted, talented people that I work with on a daily basis, it was a a huge point in being able to kind of grow things to the point where it got to be more of a company than just a freelance. Right, right. And you really do, you're, you're so loyal to these people that you've met along the way because so many of your employees and so many people that work for you, you met during your time at the Red Sox, which just goes to show how important networking is, how, um, Wow, are you seeing this little bubble? Yeah, what that was that? Up? I don't know what that was, but um, if you're watching the live video, that that happened. <laughs> anyways, they thought you made a really good point there. I, guess. I think they liked my point. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyways, the importance of networking. Clearly, the AI here agrees. Networking is super important. But but it's interesting because you talked about basically transitioning from doing everything solo to being able to hire people to being able to expand the business. And I want to talk a little bit about those early stages of creating a business because I'm going through this now. So many people who are listening may be considering going through it or actively going through the beginnings of a business. What are some of those early growing pains that you went through that maybe you have tips of advice to kind of help someone in the early stages? Because there's so much more when you're starting a business than just doing the work that you're being paid to do. Yeah. So there's a giant laundry list of lessons learned and things like that. But I would say one of the big things is just finding people that you're able to trust to hand stuff off to because you can't do everything. Um, It's like you can first off find the people outside of the production type stuff who you can trust. That's stuff that you just never need to really learn, like a really good accountant and Mm -hmm. really good you know, anything like that legal, like those things, like I don't need to waste my time trying to figure out tax code because I have someone who I know is going to nail it. And even if I put enough time to understand some of those things, I'm never going to understand it as good as, you know, a really good accountant. Well, that stuff you can offload immediately because you don't have any need to, to really kind of get into that. So when it comes to the production stuff, that's the that's the stuff that's tougher mentally to hand off because you're like my client loves working with me that's why they're hiring me and I should be on this shoot and I need to do this edit because I know exactly what they want and no one else is going to know that but kind of being able to find people one who you know that you can send on a shoot if it's you know with a client and be like the client's going to have a great experience with them as they would that I was there. They're not going to like say something stupid or screw something up or miss shots like they're trustworthy and um, building out like the biggest thing really is and it comes over time is building out systems and figuring out ways to get what you need to across the people without you having to explain it every single time and leave a lot up for interpretation. Um I think like the only way to really build a business or, you know, build out something beyond yourself is to have those systems because 
without those, it's just you individually doing everything with everyone all the time. Whereas if you have a system that people go back to that, everyone just understands that's how things go and you go and you have something to reference. So, I mean, I think there's so like when you're starting, especially when you're transitioning from freelance to um, having more of a, a business or a production company, um, there's so many things that you need to learn and that you need to do. Really, the only way to learn them is just by doing it, asking for advice from other people. Um, I had a business coach. I still have a business coach. Um, that's really helpful. Um, yeah, just getting advice from experts <laughs> and trusting other people and building out systems so you can trust the other people, I think are probably the biggest three there. Yeah, and I think that that actually makes a ton of sense because I feel like I've talked to you about this before. When you are doing the freelance work, you're doing the work that you love to do. You're making money for doing it. It's amazing. But as that grows, and I talked about this in a YouTube video recently too about why people are quitting YouTube and kind of building these big businesses and now they're bringing them down smaller. I think you think that as you scale, you might do more and more of the work you love doing, but then there's so much more that comes with scaling. Things like taxes, things like payroll, things like administration, management. And as you said, finding trusted people to help with these things, an accountant, a CPA, um, you know, a business coach, and then also having trusted workers who can help you with the lift of the work you love doing can make such a difference. And then systems, of course, putting those in place that can save your time are critical. I know, for example, you use Loom a lot to basically teach people um, through little screen recordings and voiceovers certain ways that you manage files or manage your company. You have a very detailed and structured file system for how you're archiving certain shoots and how project files are stored so that you could have five different editors working on multiple different projects at once. So you've put into play over many years these really nice organization and systems that make everything so much easier. And I think that's such a good tip and such good advice for new business owners because it really can get out of control fast. Staying organizing and building these systems and getting trusted people in play is so critical. So that, that's such a good point. I appreciate that. Um, but I want to move on. I want to talk more about Path 8 and where we are now because because you're not just in the beginning stages at this point. How many employees does Path 8 have at this point? So we have five full-time employees, including myself, two part-time, and then a good slew of freelancers that we use on a regular basis depending on the projects. And how many projects would you say you have on average at any ongoing point? How many clients are you working with? How many projects? Like how much are you managing on an average basis? It, it really flows, but I would say like in the 30 project at a time range, most of the time, sometimes be like a good deal beyond that. Sometimes it's a little bit less than that, but I'd say that's like usually, and, and those projects are in different phases. Some of them are, you know, the client's kind of been delaying feedback for three months now, and that <laughs> one's just sitting there, haven't touched it in a while. This, you know, other ones like, came in last week and it's due in two weeks on a rush job. So it's a real variety. Some projects with one deliverable, some projects with 30 deliverables. Um, mm -hmm. It's a huge variety of the projects. But um, yeah, it's it's been, we've been fortunate to have a, a constant flow of work um, from some great clients that we really enjoy working with who've kept us busy over the years. And if, if folks are in the Boston area and happen to be listening to this and want to, and not even in the Boston area, because I know you do work all over the world, if they want to reach out to Path 8 and they want to take on some video work from you, where can they find your your work, your portfolio? Where can they reach out to you? Yeah, for sure. So um, the website's the easiest, path8.com, path-8. Um, long story on that, but... <laughs> Path8.com, somebody's squatting on. They've been squatting on it for years and I can't get it. And it renews every year on my birthday. So it's oh my just like a dagger. Um, but Path8.com. Somebody, somebody that knows you is, is out to get yes, you, I guess. They're they're really um, <laughs> yeah, Google Google Path8. Uh, you'll find us. We um, we got everything there. We have a new website about to launch, so I'm excited for that. But awesome. yeah, um, that that's definitely the easiest way. We're on all the socials and everything too, but... What are, I want to talk just a little about some of the fun projects you've worked on. What are some of the projects over the course of Path 8 that you've worked on that 
always come to front of mind when you think about a project that you really loved doing? Yeah, I think that like when when I look at the work that we do, um, the ones that stick out are the ones that are a little bit different, um, you know, from a production standpoint or a story standpoint. Um, we love doing the bread and butter type projects that we do, like uh, testimonials for a healthcare company or overviews for, you know, a college or whatever it is. Like we love those projects and those are kind of the bread and butter. and We do them all the time. But the projects that kind of stand out a little more are there's been a few for the health commission that have been really great to work on. Um, you know, I kept in touch with with my my connections at the health commission when I left, and now we do some work with them. Um, kept in touch with some of my connections at my first company, and that's kind of like how I built things out with those connections. But um, you know, the like there's a project for the health commission that we're finishing up now, um, where we're working with the health commission alongside the colon cancer coalition nationally to create some PSAs highlighting some local community champions and their stories to try to get people to screen for colon cancer, wow. um, which is becoming more and more prevalent, especially in the younger um, uh, demographic. So like a project like that's super fun to work on because one, like it's a little bit different. We're doing it in a style where we did, you know, pre-interviews with all of the champions. Um, we created a script based off of their words. We filmed B-roll and their voiceover and everything, and then we're bringing them together and they're going to be used both locally and nationally to kind of get that point across. Like that's really fun and impactful work, which we really yeah. enjoy doing. Yeah. That's really rewarding too. I imagine. I mean, you're doing, you're making these videos one, but you're also doing something that means a lot to a lot of people. It can make a difference for so many people's lives. So that's, that's really awesome. I love that. So I want to talk a little bit more about your company, but in a different um, mindset, because obviously the work you do is incredible. That stands for itself. You can see it in the, in the actual videos. But I think something that you do so well, better than most people I know, is just run this whole operation. Clearly, it's huge. It's grown very quickly. And you do it without ever appearing stressed. I've worked on projects with you and I feel like I'm messaging you a thousand times about, you know, what's going on, what, where we are on deadlines and you're never stressed about it. You never, it's just amazing. You're very, very smooth in what you do. And I want to talk about that. How do you stay so calm, cool and collected while managing 30 projects at a time? So you can't see inside my head. You only see. <laughs> I just see the Slack messages exactly. that always come across with exclamation points and excitement. Yes. Um, well, like I was saying, there's so many projects going on and, and so much work and a lot to keep up with. The only way to do that is through systems and having a strong team. So having people I can rely on down to, you know, like when we work together, you're a freelancer through us. But the projects that you work on, like one of our clients in the financial section sector that you work on, you've been working on their projects since we've had them. So you're as familiar mm -hmm. with that client as I am, essentially. Sure. Um, I like to set people up so they're that so they work with that company. It helps when I'm managing so many when I'm like overseeing so many projects, um, knowing that okay, if this company does things a certain way, Kellen already knows that. I don't need to reintroduce um, at every time. I think what you were talking about before about, you know, as the company grows and you do, you, you're kind of your hats change. Like, you know, I used to love editing and I loved shooting and, and all that part of production. And like, while that is something that is still, you know, important because we're a video production company, as far as what I touch, like I, I don't, op I don't, open premiere. I don't like if I sat in front of uh, a blank edit right now, I would it would take <laughs> me forever. I'd be lost. And I used to you could throw 50 hours of footage at me and I would knock out like 10, 10 really well scripted deliverables for you. But like I couldn't even think about doing that now. Your, your kind of needs of what the company needs out of you changes over time. And as someone getting into it, you might find that you don't like that. And that's totally mm -hmm. fine. Like there, I think that like, there's so much, um, you know, momentum and, and everything around like, okay, I'm going to 
be a freelancer and then I'm going to start my own company and then I'm going to hire other people. And then, but like, maybe you just like doing the work and you don't like managing people. Like I'll say my job now is like people management and sales. Mm -hmm. Like that's what I do. I, I enjoy it. And there's different, there's different challenges to it than there are to, you know, nailing an edit. Um, and it's way different work, but I really like it. And, um, you know, the, the people part of it is really interesting. Just like finding the right people to hire, finding the right people to work with, um, and, and ones that you can trust, um, which I keep coming back to is, is huge because with all that's going on, like you can't do it alone and you can't even do a, a fraction of it alone. You need that really strong network and you need the systems in place to kind of, you know, duplicate your 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 use really easily. Yeah, and I think that's such a good point. It, the the hat you wear may change as you expand. And because of that, I don't think there's anything wrong with being an employee, not necessarily being a business owner. I think some people just love the work that they love doing and they want to keep doing that. They don't want to deal with clients, they don't want to deal with payroll, all of that stuff that we talked about. They just love doing the work they're doing. And you could run a small business and mainly do that, or you could remain freelancing, remain an employee amongst other people's businesses and not have to worry about the stresses that come with ownership. So I think that's a really interesting distinction to make. And in your case, it worked out because you love the sales part of it. You love the management part of it. But for some people, that may not be the case. Yeah. And that's totally an okay thing. Like, you know, what's really fun is going out and filming. Like, yeah. Just you can and you can make your whole career out of all right, I'm just gonna be a kick ass like DP. I'm gonna go out there, somebody will hire me. I go there, I film, I hand off footage, and I go on to the next thing the next day. Mm -hmm. Like that's a great job. And you know, and a lot of people can do really good with it. For me, I like having more of the flexibility where I can be things can be going on without me being somewhere other than here kind of managing things. But that might not be what you like. You might like being there and being on, on site and you know, all that. Like, I think that, you know, finding what, what you enjoy and really like what your goals are out of it, I think is really big when you're trying to, and, and I think it's also like, you might as well keep trying, like grow, grow to a certain point. And if you get to that point and you're like, you know what, I don't like running this, I'm going to go back and just go to be an awesome editor and just edit for people, whatever then that's great too. It's like, there's, I think the good thing with all this, especially like with this field that we're in at this time is there's just so much work and potential and opportunity of stuff that didn't exist, you know, a couple of years ago and right. it's changing by the day. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different avenues you could take it. Yeah. I mean, those are such good points and I do, we're, we're flowing so well on the business stuff, but I do want to ask some more personal stuff. Um, so I'm going to kind of transition us out of the path eight specific, but kind of in relation to it, you have a family which makes this whole thing a different beast because there's so much more responsibility. There's so much more time consumption outside of just your business. So you have a wife, you have two young children, you have a fantastic dog who's sleeping back there. If you're watching the video, he looks very, very cute. So how do you balance all of that? How is the, is there communication between you and Lauren, your wife, about, you know, when work needs to come to an end? How do you set your boundaries? Are there limit like, like, how do you handle all that? Yeah, there, there's no easy or right way to do it, I think. And I don't think that there's like, that you can possibly do them both great all the time. Like, I know that if I didn't have the family side of things, I could work so much harder and do so much more with the business. And if I didn't have the business side of things, I could be around so much more and be able to do so much more with the family. But they kind of have to play hand in hand. And it's just about figuring out the right way, the right way to do it for you at that time. Like there's mm -hmm. some times where I'm on a shoot travel shoot and, you know, the kind of I have to just hand everything off to Lauren and be like, sorry, like you have to take this one. We do a good job of working back and forth and kind of being a team where she has a really demanding, busy job, too. So, um, you know, being there for her when she needs me, her being there for me when I need her um, is important. I think like no matter what, you're not going to be the best that you could be at either one. 
because you have the other. So trying to find that balance, it changes by the day and by the minute. And having kids is the <laughs> figure like makes the biggest impact to all this. Like I when I was freelancing, I was working full time job freelancing. I could just outwork anyone because I could just put in the time. I didn't care. I worked. I'd work all day. Go. I'd I'd work, you know, eight to five. Go film a Red Sox game till midnight. Um, get up the next day, do it again. Maybe even get some editing in after that. Like it was yep. just, I didn't care. I'll just grind it out. Um, weekends work all the time. It doesn't matter. I just work, work, work. And like that's how I was able to build what I've been able to build. But if I had to start that right now with two kids at home, there's no chance I could do any of it because. They need your time more right. than anyone. And they, you know, you have to be there for them and you want to be there for them. Like I used to film like weddings, for instance, those are always summer weekends. Like I missed so many events and, and fun things with my friends and whatnot during summer weekends. And now I don't film weddings. I, I we still have our wedding company, um, but other people film them. And I'm able to spend that time with the kids and with the family. So it's like trying to figure out that balance is so difficult and something that I struggle with all the time. Um, but doing the best I can on, on both ends of it. And it's just trying to figure out and just have a little grace with yourself of like, OK, I'm doing good enough at this right now. And, you know, when I really need to put in more time, I can. And when. I don't need to put an amount of time. I can kind of pull back a little instead of just always keeping keeping the um, foot on the gas pedal. Um, and then the other part to that, like the other shoe to it is when you do have the family and you do have a, a company and employees and whatnot, like that does put more pressure on, I got to come through. Like if I was <laughs> freelancing, if I wasn't as busy, then I just make a little less money that month or whatever it is, where now it's like, okay, they got five employees relying on you for their paychecks to, to fund their lives. And you got your family relying on you too. It's like, there's a lot of weight on the shoulders when it comes to all that. So it's just a matter of kind of just keeping things going and, and doing all you can, but still <laughs> realizing that there's only so much time in a day and you got to do what you can do to kind of get through it. Yeah. I mean, everything you said there is, is, is spot on. And I think the important thing is you've got to, just find the right priorities, schedule it out so that it works for you and your family, communicate with your family to make sure that what the way you're going about it is also working for them and, and kind of just be open about the whole process. But <clears throat> clearly there is a ton of weight on your shoulders, all of these employees, your family. How do you think about balancing mental health, physical health, emotional health? Like how do you balance all of this? while doing the work and while keeping your family going and supporting your employees and all of that. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot. Like you definitely get, there's times where I'm like, <laughs> there's like a lot, a lot of uh, pressure here. I got like the beginning of the year starts and you're like, like, you know, January came around. I looked back at last year. I'm like, man, we killed it. Like we, we made a lot of money. We did, a, we did good work. We have a lot of clients. I set goals for this year. And then that, that counter resets to zero and yep. you're like, wow, how am I possibly going to get the amount of work that we need to get back to that level so that everyone's happy again at the end of this year? It just seems impossible. Um, and it's hard to it's hard to think of it when you start that first January ticker there. You're almost thinking in day to day increments. It's hard to think there's going to be 12 months here where we have opportunity to get new clients, get new work, bring in new invoices. But you think of it in kind of a condensed scale because you look at last year as a condensed item and then you look at, you know, January 3rd and you're like, we're three days in. How are we going to do it? I, I know exactly what you're talking about, but it but it is scary and it's better to look at the bigger picture and know. But it, it's hard to do that. A hundred percent. Yeah, it's it's difficult. And it's just like, you know, you just get that imposter syndrome all the time. Like you have a great day and you're like, I'm, I'm awesome at this. Like we just closed, we got a, a big deal coming in, like we're rolling. And then the second, like you have a, a couple weeks where like nothing big's coming in and there's like not a ton on the horizon. You're like, uh Oh, uh, there's like so many other production companies out there who are doing a great job. Like we're probably, it's past us by now. And then, you know what? It comes back around. So I think 
kind of going back to the, the my theme, I think that like the biggest thing you can do overall is just be consistent with everything. Um, you know, come up with systems. Be cons- like if you're doing stuff, just keep doing it. You need to be consistent and you need to adapt. So like be consistent as in be doing the work. But if something's not working, do something different. Like, you know, kind of kind of get that going. But show like if you're always there, you're always showing up, you're always doing good work. Your work's consistent. Your timing's consistent. Clients are going to like working with you and you're going to get repeat business and they're going to go to different companies and bring you on to them. I think as far as like the client side of things, if you look at it from their point of view, if you've had a job outside of this where you are working with or even if in your regular life, you hire a plumber to come do a job, just think of the things that are important to you in that you want somebody that um, seems reliable, does what like says they're going to do something and then does it. And then you pay that amount that you said that you were going to charge and you feel good about the situation there. If their communication's great, boom, all of a sudden now you're just referring them to your friends. If like they come in there, a, per- a good person to hang out with while they're doing the job, even better, like either you're writing them a Google review. So, it's really simple as far as the things that you need to do to get that repeat work and kind of keep the, keep the system going and and keep feeding things. Um, but it's just a matter of being consistent, being on top of things and just keeping it going one, one step at a time. And with, with the systems too, another quick thing is when I'm looking at that giant number that you need to get to the end of the year, I have, like a weekly scorecard that breaks everything down. So I know like what pace we're at. So, you know, you have a big number and you break it down into 52 smaller numbers. Then all of a sudden those numbers seem more doable. And then you, you start piling up some, some numbers there and all of a sudden you're like, okay, this seems doable. And you keep going and going. That's good. That's I like that. I'm only going to ask you two more questions here to, to close out. Um, and again, these will sort of shift our, our lane a little bit here. The first is if you could pick one book to inspire someone who's just getting started in this space or is maybe a creator out there, what would that book be? So I'm going to cheat a little bit. I think two books because I'm going to two different sides. So from the business side of things, um, there's a book that I actually recently told you about called The E-Myth, um, which I think with with your podcast, if your podcast had an accompanying reading, it would be the E-Myth because um, it's what it's about. Like it, the book is about the entrepreneurial myth that um, all the all the myths that kind of go into entrepreneurship and it focuses on the main gist of it is this lady is a really good at baking pies. So somebody's like, you're so good at baking pies, you need to start a pie baking company. And she starts a pie baking company and oh, wait, there's a lot more work to a pie baking company mm-hmm. than there is than, it, than just baking really good pies. So it kind of goes through that. I think if you are really good at production or whatever sort of avenue it is and you want to start a business and you want to look at that side of it, that's a book that you have to read. It's all about working on the business, not in the business is like the big takeaway from that. Um, so awesome book there. And then from the creative side, and I actually have it in front of me because I, Look at that. I, I've been like flipping through and referencing it, uh, still like an artist by Austin Cleon. Great cool. book. Um, it's a good, like inspirational book. That's got a lot of fun pictures and big writing and stuff in it. And oh, whenever wow. you're in a rut from the creative side, you'd like read a chapter in there and you like feel better about yourself <laughs> because it's, it's all about how like. There's no new ideas out there. Mm. It's just repurposing things that have been done before and doing it in a slightly different way. And sometimes when you're trying to think of an idea, you're trying too hard to like be creative or be unique or whatever, where if you kind of take it a step down and you're like, all right, what's something I've seen before? What's a twist I could put on that? It makes it a lot more attainable. I love it. Both of those suggestions are are now on the list. I promise I'm going to hit them both. They, they honestly sound... Perfect for what we're talking about here. Um, So that leads me to my last question. You've given a ton of advice. There's been a ton of incredible gems throughout this whole thing. But if you could basically go up to someone who was 
in a position right now where they're working a full-time job, they maybe don't love it, they want to get into a creative space, they love photography or videography, and they want to jump from the corporate world and start in this space. What would your advice to them be? So I've gotten this question from people often who I think the biggest thing is just take baby steps and don't put too much pressure on yourself. Like take advantage of having that job. Um, You know, when I was at the in the marketing job, when I was at the health commission, I did freelance work. I'd take a day off and go do a shoot. I'd do I'd work all night, whatever it took. Like make sure that that's something that you want to do and that it's something that you have a runway to when you leave that job. Don't just say, you know what? I like taking photos. I'm going to be a photographer. I quit. And then you day one, you're like, now where do I start? Do all that work while you're still making money and having benefits and like really take advantage of having that full time job, because once you leave, you're gone and that safety net goes with it. So, um, make sure you have that. And then once you do, and even before you do networking is like, I mean, it's obvious, but it's the most important thing you could possibly do, whether it's networking from a side of other people to work with, um, that you'll use as freelancers or, or freelance along with you, but also on the client side, like never burn a bridge. Like my biggest client still is my first company I worked at. I've worked with them ever since I left and I left there in 2012. Um, I work with, I worked at the health commission next. I do a ton of work with the health commission still. Um, and those companies, people who are working there leave and they go to other companies and then you can work with them there. Like networking is invaluable as far as people you meet on the internal side, I guess you'd call it. And also the client side as well. Um, just always be talking, looking for opportunities, Um, and you know, just put yourself out there. And then when you do get those opportunities, just, you know, obviously do a good job with them. But when you're working with the client, you know, don't be too like rigid, be, be a person. Um, just think of what you want as a client. When you're a client of somebody, think of the experience you want and replicate that, give that back to them. You know, if don't be inflexible, like if somebody wants an extra round of edits and you only put three in your contract, like who cares? Just yep. they'll be they'll come back and give you more work. If, they, if you're like a stickler, you're like, no, that's going to cost an extra whatever, because <laughs> we already went through that. Like, no, no one wants to work with that. And right. there's plenty of options out there. So be nice to people and network. Man, you are just laying down. This is like the the book that folks who are ready to start a creative business need to need to read the Pat Henderson advice book. (laughs) Unbelievable. Well, Pat, thank you so much. Why don't you just lay out kind of, I know you already gave your website, but again, just, you know, socials, wherever we can find you just so folks can, can find you. I'll put it in the description underneath as well. Yeah. Just, uh, path8.com Google us path eight productions. Um, you'll find us. We're around. We work a lot with healthcare, public health, education. Those are our main sectors. But as you were saying before, we work with companies all, all over the different industries, um, from running with Puma running to, you know, finance and, and everything in between. So, um, yeah, definitely. Um, if you have anything out there you want to chat about, just uh, reach out. Um, thanks so much for having me on this podcast. I'm glad to be, uh, one of the first few guests here. Very honored. Um, of course. Great great time chatting with you, getting to kind of talk through some of this stuff. And uh, yeah, really appreciate it. Cool. And again, if anybody needs advice on media dining at Fenway Park, (laughs) reach out to Pat. He can get you covered. There's a lot you can do there. A lot you can do. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Pat. Thanks for coming on. All right. Thanks a lot. 